Okay, uh, thank you. We'll now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. We have been joined by Councilmember Robert Cornegie, and others I'm sure will be coming shortly. Uh, we just heard from the Department of Sanitation, and now we will hear from Lizette Camilo, the Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. In the interest of time, I will forego making an opening statement. And Chair Cabrera? I will do the same. Okay, very good. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Council to swear you in, and then you can just give testimony. Sure. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Chair Cabrera, and, and committee members. I am Lisa Camilo, Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and I am joined by members of my executive team to discuss the planned expenditures and revenues for fiscal year 19, as well as highlights of the DCAS capital plan. The Mayor's FY19 executive budget supports our agency's goal of delivering essential services and expertise to city agencies, city employees, and the public to further the administration's vision for a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable city. This budget builds on our agency's accomplishments over the last year and will support our major priorities this year, including more efficient administration of civil service tests, the deployment of a space management initiative, increased MWBE utilization, and further reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from city-owned fleet and buildings. I would like to take this opportunity to provide updates for some of the projects highlighted in my FY19 preliminary budget testimony, as, we, as well as talk about some of our new initiatives. DCAS continues to work on compliance with the New York State Civil Service Law to reduce the number of provisional employees. Key to these efforts is having in place computer-based testing and application centers, or CTACs, across every borough. We currently have CTACs in four boroughs, and I'm happy to announce that TCAS will be opening a CTAC in the Bronx, located at 1932 Arthur Avenue, one of our um, DCAS buildings. And this CTAC is expected to be in operation by the end of 2018. When we open the Bronx CTAC, though, expansion, through expansion and opening of new testing centers, this administration will have almost quadrupled the testing capacity in this city. DCAS also leads the way in providing training on diversity and inclusion and equal employment opportunity rights for city employees. For FY18 to date, we have provided classroom and computer-based training to nearly 21,000 city employees, surpassing our FY18 goal of training 20,000 employees. For FY19, DCAS plans to enhance and expand its e-learning offerings and other tools provided to its citywide client base. Our upcoming citywide training module on sexual harassment is a prime example of our enhanced services. DCAS is committed, committed to working on maximizing MWBE vendor participation by conducting outreach and ensuring that MWBEs are included as a normal part of the agency's purchasing culture. As of April 30th, 2018, we have awarded approximately $87.5 million in contracts to MWBE firms in FY18. This total exceeds the FY17 MWBE award of $53 million. While we see progress, we will continue to work to increase awards to MWBE vendors. DCAS is working to make the largest municipal fleet in the nation the safest and most sustainable. An important part of this work is to expand the use of electric vehicles. To support the growing EV fleet, the city has now installed 500 electric vehicle chargers across the five boroughs and has completed the first phase of solar power electric vehicle carports. These carport charges, excuse me, these carports charge vehicles using nothing but solar power. The city's 500 electric vehicle chargers are accessible at facilities operated by several city government agencies. The solar power carports are installed at 37 locations and can fully charge electric vehicles without use of the city's electric grid. In addition, DCAS will oversee the installation of 100 level three fast chargers as funded in the executive budget capital plan. In partnership with the Office of Management and Budget and City Hall, DCAS is continuing its mission to maximize the use of all city owned and private leased spaces currently occupied by city agencies. This includes the implementation of the new space standards for workstations when designing new workspace for city employees. These efforts will allow for the creation of a more efficient and effective office environment for city agencies while making use of taxpayer dollars. 
DCAS manages city utility accounts and oversees the initiatives that strengthen energy management and generate emissions reductions across the city's portfolio of buildings. These efforts include the city's demand response program. DCAS launched the demand response program in 2013 to provide city agencies with the ability to earn revenue by reducing electricity usage during periods of peak usage and stress on the electric grid. DCAS recently announced that 23 participating agencies and organizations earned $9.3 million for reducing electricity consumption by more than 75 megawatts during the summer of 2017. This revenue is paid by utility companies and the state grid manager as part of their efforts to use pricing incentives to add flexibility to energy delivery systems. DCAS passes on the revenue earned to participating agencies who use it to implement energy efficiency projects, tackle deferred maintenance issues, and improve quality of life at their buildings. DCAS has also upgraded and customized Archibus, a work order tracking system that improves tracking and accountability of on-demand work orders. This system will provide more efficient distribution of staffing and resources for DCAS tenants. The data collected in the system will be used to guide building management staff and tenants to better work together to identify and resolve building issues. DCAS's expense budget reflects funding of $1.2 billion and a budgeted headcount of more than 2,400 in FY19. The majority of DCAS's planned FY19 expenditure, $725 million, is allocated for the citywide heat, light, and power expenses. The FY19 energy budget is a collaborative effort between DCAS and OMB in forecasting energy, agency energy usage as well as commodity rates in the upcoming fiscal year. DCAS continues to work closely with agencies citywide to enhance the energy performance of their facilities through a range of programs, including retrofitting equipment and improving operations and maintenance. In the FY19 executive budget, DCAS received expense funding to enhance our services through joint efforts with other city agencies, which include the following. DCAS was allocated funding for three positions and $750,000 to assist in the implementation of the new citywide sexual harassment policy. The funding includes $500,000 that will be used to conduct annual training for all city employees. In FY19, DCAS will receive $7 million to assume the building management and operations of the Public Safety Answering Center in the Bronx, taking it over from DOIT. One of the biggest concerns in today's world is the security of an organization's IT system. DCAS received two positions and $450,000 to help monitor our agency's IT system to, in, to ensure security. DCAS received funding for three energy engineers and $300,000 to support the efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 35% from New York City government buildings by 2025. DCAS received a total of $14 million in FY19 for the continued implementation of Local Law 2, which reimburses security expenses incurred by participating non-public schools. As requested by OMB, we have identified savings in areas that will not adversely affect the agency's ability to provide critical services to both the public and our client city agencies. Some of these include DCAS is projecting to earn an additional $4 million in proceeds from auto auctions in FY19. This revenue increase is due to higher than expected vehicle relinquishments by agencies, including sanitation trucks, resulting from the Fleet Reduction Citywide Savings Initiative. DCAS's FY18 OTPS budget was reduced by $3 million in the FY19 executive budget. This reduction was the result of savings in the OTPS budget associated with project delays in the current fiscal year. The non-public school security budget is reduced by $6.6 .6 million in the current fiscal year. This, this surplus is due to 135 schools participating in the program, substantially fewer than the 240 schools estimated at the time Local Law 2 was enacted. The FY19 total DCAS revenue budget is $69.3 million, primarily due to commercial rents of city-owned property, projected at $43.1 million, the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment totaling $11.9 million, and anticipated revenue of approximately $4.8 million in filing fees for civil service examinations. The executive budget reflects an updated four-year capital plan of $3.1 billion for FY19 through 22 to maintain and enhance DCAS facilities and obtained lease spaces, as well as to continue the energy conservation program. The, ex the executive capital budget for FY19 is $767 million and will allow us to complete some of the following initiatives. 
DCAS managed facilities. DCAS's capital construction program for city owned offices and court buildings totaled $373.7 million in FY19. This includes $210 million allocated for the renovation of office spaces and related systems upgrades at facilities such as 345 Adams Street, 210 Jerolamin Street, and 100 Gold Street. Another $60 million is also allocated for the upgrade of fire protection and suppression systems at facilities such as the Brooklyn Supreme Court and 253 Broadway. Energy conservation and clean energy projects. The capital plan for FY19 totals $204 million. This budget allocation supports both energy efficiency projects such as lighting retrofits, HVAC upgrades, steam distribution improvements, and clean energy projects like solar PV, solar thermal, and co-generation. Fleet. $14 million has been received to implement 100 EV fast chargers for city fleet operations, as well as an additional 50 solar carports. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss DCAS's planned expenditures and revenues for FY19, as well as our capital plan. I look forward to a strong, continued working relationship with the Council over the next year. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And before we go to questions, I just want to say that we have been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Parkinson, Councilmember Yeager, and uh, some council members do have questions. But let me start with you a little bit about solar panel installation. <clears throat> In the preliminary budget response, we asked the administration to increase capital funding for facilitating the installation of solar panels on city buildings. This wasn't done even though DCAS has a goal of installing 100 megawatts of solar power panels on city buildings by 2025. How many megawatts have we installed to date? To date, we've installed, and, and I'm joined here by Deputy Commissioner Anthony Fiore, who can certainly elaborate. We've installed to date 10 megawatts, which is uh, significant uh, throughout this uh, administration. And we are on tap to install a total of 25 by the end of calendar year 19. A fiscal 19? Calendar year. Mm -hmm. And what are the uh, major impediments to installing megawatts um, more quickly? So installing solar panels on roofs uh, it requires a number of different um, things. We have to have a, a roof that is ready for, to be able to support that infrastructure. So a lot of capital work needs to be done to prepare those roofs. Not all roofs are created equal. Um, if they are in, located in shady areas where they don't have access to the sun, uh, that is not going to work. Um, but I, I can toss it over to Anthony to continue and elaborate. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's right. I think some other constraints are um, beyond just finding suitable sites is finding um, developers out there with the right financing structures. That's been somewhat difficult to do as well. Um, so there's, there's a number of challenges that, that face us, but I don't think it's one of um, capital dollars for, for the solar panels themselves. So um, I'm curious about city schools. Um, have we installed solar panels there? And um, from what I've heard, um, oftentimes buildings are a little bit too old to hold or contain the solar panels. Is that true? Um, can you speak about that a little bit with city schools? Yes, so we have installed a number of solar panels on, on schools, in schools, and, there, and that work is continuing um, through a number of different uh, means. Uh, and as I mentioned before, and you, you just mentioned, not all roofs are, are solar ready. So we are actually have been in discussions with the School Construction Authority uh, to, to look at their capital plans and, and try and work in a solar ready um, uh, work as they work through some of their capital projects. Yeah, and I'd just say that schools represent the largest portion of our solar program. It's about two thirds of our program when you look at both the completed projects and projects in the pipeline. Um, they tend to have the best roofs because they're generally larger, flat, with less mechanicals on them. So they do make up the majority of our, of our portfolio. So did you say anything about the age of the buildings and the ability for schools to hold the solar panels themselves? Are they I think strong that, enough to be able to hold them? I think it depends on many things. You, can, you might have a maybe not as old structure, but perhaps a, a roof that's well, like in disrepair. Well, you, well, you've already installed them. Are they older schools or newer schools? Do you have an idea of that? Um, I, I can get you the breakdown uh, on that. 
So I was always curious about the relationship between um, the work that you're doing and SCA, because the funding is not going through SCA, am I right? For the solar panels? Right. We, 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 fund those. we do fund um, you do. solar panels. No, but the funding goes through you? The funding goes through us, that's correct. And, and I didn't know that anybody could go near a school unless they went through SCA. Can you explain to me how that happened? So typically the SCA builds new facilities and does the heavy renovations, I think, for the purposes of energy work. Um, we work with the, either the Department of Education's facilities group and, and to, to do you know, work on there and fund th some of those projects. Um, and for installing solar panels, we fund that through uh, our budget. So then this is not considered major construction? So there's both major construction and, and non-major construction. So both the SEA and the Division of School Facilities implements solar projects. Um, it depends on the, the size of, of it. Um, so sometimes the, they are capital projects that SCA does. And again, I think that's generally when it's a new school or a major renovation that's happening. Um, but DSF also does small capital projects as well as expense projects. So the projects that are going through you are being done by private developers, by private contracting? Uh, it, it's the funding that, that's uh -huh. going through us, um, but it's either SCA consultants that are doing the work or it's D DSF consultants like the Gordian Group. Or Do you work with MWBs for, to d install these panels? Um, I'd have to check on, on the specifics. Um, union I, workers? Union workers have been employed, yes. On, on all, in all cases or just in some? Uh, in some. Okay, can we get that information? Sure. sure. Uh, regardless of, and as you know, with, um, uh, with, with unions, uh, depending on the, the solicitation, we cannot require union labor to work on, on our projects. However, all of our projects are required to, to be paid as prevailing wage. Okay. Um, let me go to the provisional reduction plan. In a quarterly report on provisional sent out to the council on March 30th, you reported that the number of provisional employees employed by the city uh, had declined by a net of only eight positions from 21,060 to 21,052 over the past three months. Why has this decline been so low, and what are the major impediments you're facing uh, preventing a greater reduction in the number of provisionals employed by the city? So the, I'm happy to report that I think that there's a time lag uh, by the time uh, we, pr we produce that report because um, the most recent numbers that we have, uh, we have a, a current um, number of 20,164, which is actually the lowest number of provisionals since this uh, fact has been tracked. Uh, so we are seeing um, a lot of progress in this area. Now, with respect to what some of the challenges are, uh, we, we have many here. Uh, the, we have 800 titles, uh, unique titles, competitive titles, that we would be required to give exams for in order to be able to keep up with the lists that agencies need in order to hire. So in order to ensure government operations, um, agencies, if we, don't, if we haven't had the ability to offer an exam and the services need to be provided and we don't have a list, then they hire provisionally. So, um, it's, it, we're, we're working on multiple paths in order to really drive down those numbers, and we're seeing success, um, and, and we're happy to, to, to report the, the new figures today. I think what's of concern to us in the council is that state law says that they're not supposed to be provisional for more than nine months. How long have these 20,000, I think 164, you said, uh, employees been on, on the payroll? So it, it, it varies. Um, you know, once we put out a list and we have uh, one, one title taken care of, and if an agency needs uh, others that we don't have that, so it, it really does vary. Um, we have been working very closely with the State Civil Service Commission, who has been uh, very involved in monitoring our progress. And we have worked together on a plan to reduce it in increments. There's no way that we can wipe out over 20,000 provisional employees with one foul swoop. Um, but we've laid out a very thoughtful plan uh, to work on, as I said, as I mentioned, um, uh, through, 
through multiple areas, multiple paths to try and really reduce that number. When we started the provisional reduction plan, uh, which was approved by the state not too long ago, we had we started with over 23,000 um, provisional employees, and since throughout the duration of this plan, we've seen it fall, um, you know, to to a little over 20,000. So we are seeing success. The state really does understand all of the challenges and the difficulties because we're trying to balance a number of interests all on with with one uh, with one goal in mind, uh, but we can't let government operations and services suffer as a result. Can you provide us with a list of uh, provisionals by date of employment? By date of employment? I'm sure we can, yes, we can. put that, that together That would be for helpful, for us, sure. helpful for us also. Um, I had the uh, recent pleasure of visiting your new uh, center in Queens. Great. Beautiful. And it looks really nice, um, which we applaud. Uh, how are these testing centers operating? And are they playing any role in helping fill the provisional jobs? So there, we've been finding um, with every new CTAC that we bring online, we we're actually very shocked at how many people are coming up and, and taking exams. With the Queens one in particular, ever since it opened, it almost outperforms uh, the, the Brooklyn, Manhattan, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. Manhattan and Brooklyn. And so we clearly hit a nerve. Um, and we have a lot of Queens residents come in and, and really take advantage of that. And absolutely, this is one of the tools that we have to be able to drive down the provisional numbers. The more people we have taking exams, hopefully we'll have more populous lists uh, for agencies to use for longer that will prevent the need for us to reissue that exam. Um, but we, we, which is why we're really happy to announce that we have a, the, our fifth and last one to be open at the end of this year. Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about the uh, real estate services management program. Uh, the executive plan includes two new U of A's for real estate services. Does this represent a new division within DCAS's internal operating structure? No. So we, um, a little while ago, restructured our asset management line of service. Uh, asset management contained uh, the, the groups that maintained our 55 city-owned uh, and managed buildings. It, it contains our capital construction group and the real estate services group, which deals with finding uh, leased space uh, for city agencies' needs. Um, and when we restructured that, we really wanted to create a separate standalone unit to focus just on that, on maximizing the city's uh, city-owned footprint uh, with respect to office leases and only release out uh, whenever we uh, whenever we need to. This required, and in order to add transparency and accountability, we thought that not only separating it within uh, the agency, the, the, we, we were working with CoNB to create a separate uh, unit of appropriation in order to finish the, the structure. So right now, I think what you're seeing is the start of that work, and we're working with OMB to finish transferring the funds and the headcount that originally was within the asset management line of service to the real estate services. Uh, and so will this help um, uh, bear a repeat so we don't have a repeat of Rivington House? It's, it's within that unit that, uh, that, dealt, that deals with deed modifications. The unit of appropriation is obviously a budgeting exercise to be able to provide Council, OMB, DCAS, with more transparency and accountability. Uh, but with regard to the deed modification process, we've been working hand in hand with the council once the, the law was passed to really overhaul the process. Uh, that is what is going to prevent another Rivington. We have a number of stop stopgap measures and increased notice and increased um, public awareness. Uh, to be able to prevent that from happening again. So local law 176 is being implemented? Absolutely. Okay. And then finally, in the executive plan, the campaign finance board's lease budget, uh, which is in the Department for Citywide Services budget, was reduced by $200,000 in fiscal year 2019. Uh, why is CFB's lease budget, budget decreasing? My understanding, and I'm going to toss it over to Laura Ringelheim, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate Services, uh, is because there was an adjustment on the reduction of uh, heating and cooling. So I, I can't talk exactly to why OMB would have reduced the budget. I know what we're trying to do is reduce uh, when they're going to move to a new lease space, which is um, better suited to meeting their after-hours uh, HVAC requirements. So the cost is an 
anticipated to be as high. Um, so that could be the reason why it's been reduced in this budget cycle. So they're not going to be moving their offices to 255 Greenwich? They still might be moving to 255 Greenwich. We're working with them now on um, revising their needs to meet the citywide space standards um, to see where we can scale down and they can scale back and, and we're almost there. And where they finally end up will be a matter of whether we can negotiate that space with the landlord. Okay, so they're coming in, I think, later, so I'm going to ask them a follow-up question on that as well. All right, thank you. Chair uh, Cabrera. Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, Chair Drum, and I want to thank you because you're literally here for every single one of the hearings uh, and completely engaged, and uh, as well as us, the staff. Commissioner, uh, welcome. I have a few questions uh, so we could hear uh, thereafter uh, my colleagues uh, that I know they have questions. So if you could give me the short version answer of these. So uh, my first question is, regarded, is regarding reverse auctions. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I noticed that uh, DCAS is expected to generate an additional $5 million in revenue from reverse auctions. Uh, are these items uh, that are being sold in, in auction, are they brand new or they use equipment, uh, vehicles? So this is um, a, a new initiative that ONB has done a, a initial research to determine uh, whether we can actually generate savings when we when the city purchases goods or commodities um, and that other jurisdictions have shown some savings. So I think we're working with OMB and the law department to implement a reverse auction strategy. So that would be that would mean um, so if we were going to buy a particular commodity, vendors, uh, you know, beating each other with, with the lowest price uh, on, a, on an IT platform. Um, but right now, we're still studying that, and, and OMB will, will be working with OMB to figure out what commodities yet. This has not yet been rolled out. But are uh, these going to be new items that we bought, and we bought too many of them for whatever reason? Or are these uh, equipment that you had laying around for a few years to say, hey, we no longer need them, and then we're going to sell them? So that would be, uh, it's a slightly different. So the, we actually auction off surplus properties. So properties that we have purchased, we have used, we have no uh, use for anymore, and so we auction that off, <coughs> excuse me, to the public. That's already happening. Okay. Uh, reverse auction is a way to purchase goods, to buy goods, but have uh, the vendors compete against the clock, almost like um, an eBay auction. Gotcha. Uh, so rather, than, but rather than going up, the prices would be com coming down. And I think OMB is doing it, it did the initial research. Did you uh, do you think this is a bit uh, much that we are like overspending fi by five million dollars? Uh, if, if we're projecting uh, to get five million dollars, I'm sure we're, we're getting pennies on the dollars. I'm not sure what's the forecast here expectation uh, how many pennies on the dollar uh, but usually like if we're going to use the compatible uh, eBay platform that uh, that we're, we're, we're spending you know uh, like we over purchasing here to the tune of five million dollars I think <clears throat> excuse me I think that what the reverse auction is a tool that will help us get better a better deal um, and, and the five million dollars is something that I think, OMB, uh, in its initial research, thought that it would be a, a reasonable target, but this requires additional uh, study. We, we're not sure what commodities we're going to, to, to purchase through the reverse auction. That still requires some more analysis. Um, and OMB, I think, would, would, you know, would, would be able to provide more information. Okay. Uh, let me move on to uh, fleet coordination uh, initiative and the Fleet Optimization Initiative. Um, which agencies get sued the most from lawsuits uh, stemming from car accidents? Hi, Keith Kerman, the Chief Legal if could, Officer. If you could turn the, the mic on, please. Thank you. Hi, Keith Kerman, the Chief Fleet Officer. Um, certainly, the Police Department, the Fire Department, and the Department of Sanitation have some of the most serious fleet related events and some of the highest litigation and claims issues. And do you have cameras in, the, in all of these vehicles? We do not implement cameras in vehicles currently. We are outfitting 
and announced today a whole suite of safety measures for city vehicles, including, uh, let me strike that, we don't have frontal cameras, we do have backup cameras. Um, backup cameras, automatic braking, which is the singular most potentially beneficial technology. We know that about 40% of all the collisions that result in litigations involve rear ending. So automatic braking, if you're familiar with the technology, will basically help automatically stop a vehicle. If we're about to smash something in front, we'll right. begin to take control of the vehicle, um, as well as variable headlamps, dr um, driver alert systems. I, I came here in an all-electric vehicle with this new safety suite, and it's really an amazing set of alerts. As you drive, every second, the driver, the car is communicating to the driver, telling them you're coming off the lane, you're going too fast. So we are making a lot of investments to make the cars safer in general, including backup cameras, but not frontal cameras. Well, my thoughts are that, uh, you know, you, you're going to have, uh, uh, in the public, you're going to have people who are going to sue us, claiming it just happened, and then you're going to have a, you might have a portion of them that are not so honest, uh, but there's something to be said about having a camera. I mean, it's just... <laughs> A video camera would literally uh, it will help the law department to be able to say, "Hey, we're not going to settle. Uh, we, we, you know, we have uh, uh, video proof here." And so, wouldn't that make sense? And at the end, be more cost effective than doling out, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Well, one of the technologies going to your point about having independent verification that is coming in place, and it's very, very interesting is automatic vehicle um, collision reconstruction. So as we go into this new set of vehicles, and we have some of this about 800 vehicles now, as you're in a collision, we will get an automatic alert from the car that this car has just been in a collision and immediately be sent a report and we could share what this looks like. They will tell you where the collision took place, what part of the vehicle was hit, what the speed was, what the maintenance codes were. So we're moving in this direction. We are also, you may know, in partnership with the Department of Transportation, doing what's called a V2V, a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle project that's being funded by federal DOT that will involve a little bit of the technology you're talking about. So we are moving pretty heavily in this direction. We do have to vet the technologies, though. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not at the full kind of light up of cameras yet, but, but we are getting there. I, I, I will hope that you know, there will be further discussion, it will be on your radar. I'm thinking also sanitation trucks that during snowstorms, people say, I got swiped. And, you know, sometimes very hard to prove who did what. Uh, and also it keeps the drivers honest and being more, it raises the level of consciousness as to uh, how uh, one should be driving. Uh, the other question is related uh, in the pre preliminary budget response, we call for the expansion of DCAS demands resp response program to reduce the city's day-to-day -day energy expenses. Uh, can you uh, give us a little bit more detail regarding the specific of the... Uh, I, I'm sorry, energy load management. And if you could give us... Um, a little bit more detail about the initiative, and uh, and also uh, if you could talk about why we can achieve greater savings more quickly. So the demand response uh, is event specific, uh, and what we are hoping to do is do something a little more comprehensive, which is a load management program that we've been funded to do, uh, which essentially will fund uh, people or forehead count, I think we've received, to work through throughout city facilities and really, fr on a, from a, a, as, as comprehensive way as possible, really work to reduce the, the energy consumption um, within these buildings. I'm going to toss it over to Anthony to talk more about it. Yeah, we're very excited by, you know, the load management program. Um, we think it has a lot of opportunity. It's not just technology that's needed to actually make that successful, and, and we are installing real-time meters in um, many of our buildings so that um, uh, facility operators have the, can be empowered to see what changes they make, how that affects things in real time. But it's also cultural change, and so through training programs, 
um, through building automation systems, all that needs to come together. So there's actually a lot of work that has to happen in order to make sure that that program is successful. Okay, uh, if we could start thinking about how we could have greater savings more quickly, uh, I, I think that uh, we, we could do more. And so my last question, because I really want to hear my colleagues and give them uh, time, and I'll come back uh, with second round. Uh, how many, how many uh, if you were to compare the amount of city-owned properties versus the ones that we lease, what would be the percentage? And have we uh, given thought of, of uh, retrofitting some of the buildings that we do owe so we're not paying these high <coughs> leases, especially uh, in areas where you're paying a super amount of money? Absolutely, and we are doing that work in terms of looking at our city-owned buildings to try and bring in um, and expand uh, the, the density and the usage of our own city-owned footprint. Um, we, we currently have uh, 251 leases in private, for office leases in private entities. Um, we do have, city, the DCAS manages 55 buildings, half of which are courts, half of which are not courts, but there are other city properties that are owned and managed by other city agencies. We can come back and provide you the list of all city-owned properties that are, uh, that, that are in the portfolio. Uh, but for the office leases, it's about 251. But like as I mentioned, we are. If, mm -hmm. if you could include, I'm sorry, Commissioner, the square footage, because you know you have a building that only has two floors and you know 10,000 square feet versus a building that may have Different. half a million square feet. So if you could include uh, that as well, okay. Absolutely. Uh, so with that, I give it back to uh, uh, co-chair, and looking forward to hearing my colleagues. Okay, thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Powers, Maisel, and Adams, and we have questions from Councilmember Cornegy, Rosenthal, Perkins, Yeager, and Powers. Okay, so Councilmember Cornegy. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. Um, so in the DCAS portfolio, I'm curious as to how many rentable or rented retail spaces in DCAS's portfolio? So we have 80 long-term leases, not all of which are retail. Do we have that number with us? We don't, not the number of retail, but 80. We can get you the number, the exact number of retail uh, leases that we, that we have on our properties. So everybody is aware, and I'm not going to be Captain Obvious on this, everybody is aware that we have a, a, a retail affordability crisis in the city. And I'm wondering that in the DCAS portfolio, are those rented or rentable units at market or below market? So for the long-term leases under the charter, uh, long-term leases are required to be publicly auctioned. So that the, the term, lease terms are, are determined by by the auction, um, and typically, uh, it depends on the on the market. So I, I'd be curious, and, and obviously, I'm speaking from my my former chair hat as the chair of small business. I now chair housing and buildings, but I'm, but I was always curious as to whether or not we, as a city, could be helpful in this afford in the retail affordability crisis by using uh, units that are in our purview uh, at below market. So I'd like to explore that a little bit. Absolutely, uh, we'd be happy at a, at a later date. We'd be ha more than happy to sit down and go through, you know, our portfolio, what what you know has retail uh, functions on it, and how we can work together to to, to do that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, nice to see you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chairs, for this hearing. I want to ask about two general areas. First, about um, some news we learned at the NYPD hearing that um, the Special Victims Division would be moving in Manhattan, would be moving into 137 Center Street. Could you um, tell me a little bit about what you envision there? The more important, the biggest question is, what are your plan, do you have marching orders for all of the special victims divisions in every borough. 
So, or is it just this one? And have you been given guidelines for what to make this space able to accommodate? So we provide those, that service for all agencies that require new space. Uh, with respect to the Manhattan Division, we've had discussions about them expanding their footprint. They're already at 137 uh, Center, so expanding their footprint within that building. And for any of the other boroughs, uh, we will be working together very closely to determine what, the, what their needs are, what their space needs are, conference rooms, special uh, requirements to determine how much space and, and what exactly their needs are. Have you been asked to look for space in the other boroughs? Yeah, we're looking for space. We're working with PD closely to, to assess their needs in each of the boroughs. I think Manhattan, they came up with the first solution because they're already at 137 Center that can be retrofitted to meet the requirements that were, that were told to us by um, NYPD. But, but the rest of the boroughs, we're also working with them closely to see if we have city-owned space versus the space that can accommodate these special requirements. What do you think the timing will be? <clears throat> for Manhattan or every for Manhattan first I, I think they're going to be able to do it relatively quickly I'm not sure um, that we've established a timeline yet okay if we could keep a line of communication open on that I'd be very curious to know and by the way the um, they're modeling off of the child um, advocacy centers so it, it if you need a model to go look at that's exactly the one um, Philadelphia happens to have an extraordinary one. You can just Google Philadelphia Special Victims Division 2013, okay. um, and, and they'll show you what a world-class um, model would look like. Secondly, um, so are you able to start working on 137 Center today, or does that begin next fiscal year? I think PD has, is planning on working on it as soon as possible. They've already toured the site, and we have sent our architects over there to see how we could meet the needs, including the, the requirements to have um, more than one entrance uh, for the building. So I, I, it's, that project is, as far as I know, um, ready to begin immediately. Great. Um, Chair, may I just ask one more question? Yes, one more. Thank you. Um, it has to do with the work that you're uh, department is doing now with the Stop Sexual Harassment Act. You note in your testimony 500000 to develop um, the sexual harassment training and provide it, three new staff people. Could you talk a little bit more about that and the fact that Don just walked up here gives me so much confidence. I'm <laughs> thrilled. I'll kick it off and I'll turn it over to Don. Uh, so we have developed, as you know, a computer-based training that is available immediately to start the training. We received approval to uh, do in-person training because not all city workers have access to regularly to a computer. So we really want to make sure that we're out there getting the word out and doing this training. Um, and the addition uh, of three lines is really to augment our resources to be able to do a, a host of things, um, audit agencies, EEO, um, re research and um, um, how they handle EEO complaints, or I'm sorry, sexual harassment complaints to make sure that they're be properly being investigated uh, and, and have good, well, determinations that are, that are appropriate. Um, look, doing third party uh, investigations as well, um, looking into and investigating some uh, allegations of sexual harassment um, and to assist in some of our trainings. I'll turn it over to Don to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And also following our meeting with you, um, we talked about also bringing our non-mayoral agencies into the fold. And so we've been working with them, um, specifically DOE, NYCHA, health and hospitals, to make sure that there's clarity around definitions, having standardized reporting to make sure that we meet our um, annual reporting mandate. And also we're going to offer a lot more training, specifically around complaint procedures, investigative protocols, making sure we remain best in class. Is the training manual you brought to the hearing, is that the one you're using? And can we find the training online by going to the DCAS website? Currently, the sexual harassment training that we've launched, um, it's been an internal launch. Um, it's been launched within um, DCAS, and it 
will be made available to every city agency. Currently is not on our external website. The training that I was referring to was specifically around complaint procedures and investigative protocols to once again ensure that our EEO officers and liaisons are well versed in all areas of investigations. So is it different than the one that was distributed at the hearing? The investigations training, yes it would be, but the sexual harassment training that we've launched on the 9th, no, that training is consistent. Okay. Um, there were some minor um, edits that CCHR and EEPC had that we incorporated, but that training is um, launched currently. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Perkins. Am I on? Yes. So the Board of Elections in the Bronx office at 1780 Grand Concourse is in poor condition with regular leaking from a dialysis facility on the floor above, at times threatening the board's servers. So what is the present condition of the other boards as well? Are there similar maintenance issues that need to be addressed? So we, we are engaged in a site search for the Bronx space because we know the conditions aren't good. Sorry, you want me to repeat that? For the Bronx space, we know the conditions are not good in that space, and we are continually looking for new space when that lease expires, which it's due to relatively quickly. We haven't heard of any other sites that are in similar condition. Have you looked into making sure that there are no other similar kind of problems in other sites, throughout in the other boroughs? Generally, the the Board of Elections or the agencies reach out to us when there are problems. We're in you know, communication as necessary after lease execution, um, but we haven't heard of anything. So right now, what is happening with the Bronx office? It's a very large site. I think it's 80,000 square feet. So we're searching for a site that could accommodate that size need. So you plan on moving from that site to another site? And, in the and how long was, do you think That'll take the usual process once we site select um, is about 18 months to enter into a lease after that. I'm, uh, you know, depending on the scope of work necessary to get that space into condition, there's a lot of requirements with the election spaces, um, including so ramps in, and in lifts. So, so we're, we are searching though for So, it. in the meantime, how are we managing that situation? So, it's that leaky situation, right? Right. Um, the, the with the Board of Elections, and I, I think they have reached out to us sometimes, it's a landlord, if we can help with, um, you know, giving any assistance to the Board of Elections in dealing with the landlord to make necessary repairs, we do. We know that there have been some remediations done, but that Board of Elections still wants to leave that site. So, so, in the, so the, the Board has been in touch with the owner and efforts are being made to take care of that problem? as what they've conveyed to us is that they really want to leave that space. They want to leave that space? They want to leave that space. In the meantime, how long will that take? We have not yet been able to identify a new site, as far as I know, the last that it came to my attention. So we can check on that and see where we are and, and what properties, if any, we have shown them. And how are we dealing with the present condition until such time that another opportunity that comes about? How we right. Generally, if it's a lease space, the, the agency occupying that space deals with the landlord. Um, their facilities group would deal with landlord. We GCAS is usually called in if there is some question about the lease terms that we might have somebody that might know something about. But I, I believe most of those communications as far as remediations have been between Board of Elections and that landlord. But in the meantime, what, 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 what is the time frame when the problem will be more or less fixed? Do, do we have any indication from anybody that is responsible for this? I, I just, I can't answer if they've if fixed it to the satisfaction. My understanding is they have not been able to fix it to the satisfaction of the Board of Elections. So that's why we're looking to move them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Perkins. Councilmember Yeager, followed by Powers and Kalos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, I, I just have uh, questions on two topics, and I'll try to go very quickly. I know the clock is working against us. Um, you indicated uh, that, the, that the cost for uh, the non-public schools 
security program, which we talked about, you may recall, during the preliminary budget, was not actually included in the preliminary budget. Uh, it was at zero. And I asked you about it, and you said, well, we expect to have it included in the executive budget. You didn't indicate at that time that it would have a reduction, and perhaps you didn't know. Um, and you indicate now that the reason there's a reduction is because you're anticipating uh, fewer schools participating uh, than had been anticipated by the authors of the legislation in the last council. Um, haven't gotten to the question yet. My question is uh, twofold. First of all, is DCAS actually working very hard? And I'll leave you to determine whether or not the, you know, how to describe very hard or how to define it to enroll non-public schools that may be eligible. And my second point to the question is I became aware recently and I had conversations with your agency that due to a change in regulation by the State Department of Education, which required separate BES numbers for individual buildings. So for example, where one school may have had five buildings, they had one BES number, 500 students, 100 per building, they are now classified as five separate schools of 100. Um, my, my, uh, uh, based on my knowledge of how this law was drafted, that was not the intent of the bill's authors when they put in the BES requirement. So now DCAS is essentially saying that if a school has to have separate BES numbers, uh, they cannot avail themselves of the program. Is that also something that's affecting the cost of the program going down because schools that we anticipated or my predecessor council anticipated uh, would be able to partake are no longer able to partake because of the way DCAS is defining the law. When the $19 million or so uh, was written into the law, the estimates were, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we anticipated about 240 yes. uh, schools to participate, which is how, um, I think, in combination with the council and OMB, uh, determined that $19 million would be the, the budgeted amount. Um, through our experience in administering this program in the past couple of years, we have not seen 240 schools be enrolled. Uh, we have done many outreach efforts, uh, multiple meetings with the public, public notices, trainings were out there, really trying to get the word out, not only to publicize and market the program itself, but to really uh, educate uh, schools on what the process is. Uh, so I think that we're doing uh, a lot of outreach uh, to try and drum up the, the, the word um, uh, across the, the, the schools. Um, but in fact, we have had lower than anticipated enrollment, uh, which has affected our, um, our, our request for reimbursement of this program. Um, the, so the, the, the $14 million that were allotted uh, in, this, in the upcoming fiscal year reflects what we anticipate the usage will be. However, um, because the law authorizes up to $19 million, as we go through and, and, and provide uh, reimbursements, if we see that there's going to be a, a need to increase that funding, we will work with OMB to increase that funding to meet the, the needs and the requirements of, of the, of, of hopefully, an increased um, enrollment. Uh, with regard to the change in the law, as you know, the local law uh, specifically mentions beds numbers. And so, unfortunately for all of us, the state has changed how they determine uh, the how they allot that um, that uh, uh, beds number. Uh, we are happy to work with the council to change the legislation and the definition and how we uh, determine uh, qualifications to to the program. But as of right now, um, we're we're kind of they changed the the definition midstream. Um, the original uh, cohorts that have been participating since the program started. We have a three-year memorandum of understanding. They have been relying on those terms, um, and that's where you know, we're, we're proceeding as, as is. So unfortunately for the new applicants that are under the, the, new, um, the new definition, it, it might change the, our, um, our administration of it. Mr. Chair, may I continue just very briefly? Um, uh, with regard to the best numbers, I would suggest, Commissioner, that you have within your authority 
to allow uh, schools that have current BES numbers before they have applied for new BES numbers to break out their enrollments as required by state DOE to allow them to use their old BES numbers because those numbers are valid uh, for informational purposes. They're simply, they were inserted into the statute and uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't land here from outer space yesterday. I was involved a little bit in that statute and, and many members of this body who are here today uh, were involved in writing that bill. It was there to help you identify a school. So I would suggest that you have the ability to simply allow schools administratively to use their existing BES numbers. I want to just real briefly something else. Um, you indicated uh, that there was a savings of $200,000 due to a reduced uh, cost for the Campaign Finance Board to provide heat and uh, HVAC, et cetera. Um, as you know, and that my question doesn't involve that, but my question involves the lease agreement uh, because the Deputy Commissioner mentioned that DCAS is now currently uh, in the process of once again going out to assist the CFB in getting its apparently much needed new space uh, because after having moved into space three years ago, uh, that space is no longer uh, able to hold their uh, ever-growing efforts and great work and the uh, bajillion people that they hire and have working there. Um, this council, uh, through its efforts in the last several months, this new council since January was able to uh, encourage you gently to withdraw a boondoggle lease of that would have cost the city approximately two to three million dollars a year to give the campaign finance board 50 and change thousand feet square feet from the 17,000 square feet that it had currently had because they were going to run some kind of super war room up there with eight conference rooms and you know, parking spaces and whatnot. Um, and so now you're indicating that you're gonna go out there and help them again find new space. And uh, my reflection to you is based on what we've seen here, uh, at least what I've seen, is the, the CFB is doing just great. Uh, they have an office space that's, it, it was designed to fit their needs. It was designed per spec to their needs. It's brand new, it's beautiful. Uh, God willing that this council ever had office space as beautiful as the CFB's office space. And I'm not sure why the DCAS feels the need to go out once again to help an agency that just moved into brand new office space, brand new, to help them find new office space. And it would seem to me that we're on the path to another boondoggle lease. And I would encourage you to rethink uh, whether or not that's necessary. And if you have any comments that you'd like to make, uh, Deputy, I'm happy to hear them. Thank you. And I see you looking at me. <laughs> so, um, you know, C CFB has articulated reasons why the current space doesn't work. They have had an increase in headcount. So we have looked at their current space and agree with them that it doesn't, it doesn't fit. They have really maximized use of that space. They've been in compliance with the citywide standards since they got in and have made renovations themselves in order to fill every last nook and cranny. So their headcount, which um, you know they, they can talk more about what they have for this budget cycle and what's been approved, but we, we would just agree that they, they can't fit more th their current approved headcount in their existing space. Um, they are, they have uh, worked with us over the past couple of months since the last time that um, we were before you and reduced significantly the number of conference rooms, seeing where they can use multi-purpose rooms as conference rooms, um, as the, the sound studio, instead of creating separate spaces for all of those. Their headcount has also, they're going to do it to the size requirement that they currently have um, approval for and not anticipating new needs. So, so they're downsizing in that respect. Um, you know, all of that said, if they do end up moving to the new space to accommodate this need, we will backfill their current space. We will make use of that space um, with, with another agency's needs. So it, it won't go unused, um, but, but that's their, their programmatic argument for meeting that headcount. We don't have another space um, either in their existing building to put the additional headcount. Well, first of all, they can reduce their headcount. I know that's not on you. But secondly, if they were to move out 100 Church, which would be used by Oath, I know you didn't say that, but that's pretty much I understand the plan, and Oath does need the space, but it would have to be redesigned once again, thus costing the taxpayers a whole bunch of more money uh, to do something, redo something that was just done three years ago, and I think that we can do a little better, um, and certainly a little more with a little less, I would hope. We, we can certainly, um, you know, revisit that conversation if they will end up staying in that space. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Powers followed by Kalos. Uh, 
I'm not going to talk about the CFP. I think Calvin has uh, covered that. Uh, the um, I, had a, I just was looking through the budget. I had a couple questions on some items that were getting funding reduced or changed. Um, one is I noticed there's an immigration plan item in the budget if for – uh, $327,000 reduced to 79000 Any, what, what is that program and is there a reason for the reduction in the spending? Rather than speculate, we don't have the materials in front of oh, it. Is. Oh, it's Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs. Um, we believe. For the, yeah. Yes, uh, there's uh, adjustment for Moya, 327,000 FY18 and 79,000 FY19. There a reason why the the mayor's office of immigrant immigrant affairs and international affairs. Immigrant affairs. Immigrant affairs. Is there a reason they are losing 200 and something million dollars? They're losing 200. I mean, I'm sorry, not million. It's the thousand dollars. Yes. No, no, it's an addition. Oh, this is an additional on top of the. Okay, got it. So you're adding in money for there. Is there? So what's the what's the reason for the increase then? That one we would have to get back to okay. you on. Yeah. Okay. Just question. And then the second is we have a uh, program that's the film shoot reimbursements program. What is that? So we um, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Uh, we have many city properties where uh, there are film companies who want to utilize for back for sets for film shooting. Um, and we get reimbursed. We submit, uh, so we provide certain services like cleaning, security. So at the, uh, at the end of the process, we'll calculate how much the film, how much we incurred as a cost, and then bill the film company. So this is like billing them for, for cost For the cost. There. Correct. It's a reimbursement at the end of the day. Got it. And I think we're recognizing savings through procurement reform. Is there, can you tell us what the reforms are? So that's uh, related to the project that is being spearheaded by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. We are all, this, all city agencies are working to implement Passport. Um, and we believe that we will gain many efficiencies through uh, moving towards electronic um, trans, uh, electronic administration of procurements, whether it be RFPs or bids. Right now, the first wave of the deployment has already happened, uh, so we have an online Vendex uh, that everyone is now using, so that's what that's related and to. And is this the, is, would this be the only year where we, are we participating in the out years out that there will be more savings? Is, are we like, where are we in that process of doing the... So yeah. the, first, the first rollout has already happened, uh, and Mox is working on currently building the, the, ro the second phase rollout. Okay, great. Thank you. See, I like that. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Perfect timing. Well Perfect done, timing. my friend. <laughs> Councilman Vakalos. I'm sorry, we've also been joined by Gordenchik, if I didn't say that before. I'd like to uh, start by thanking the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for pulling contracts in my district, uh, which we have used to hold people who had 40-year contracts with the city accountable. And uh, we were able to work with them to actually take a city property that had been literally falling apart since before I was born and then take them over and maintain it in a process that took more than two years. But hopefully we will see an improvement uh, on my, in my district's waterfront, so I wanted to thank your office for that. I know it was not a pleasant process trying to extract uh, community benefits uh, from a DCAS contract, but I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I'd like to touch on uh, four questions uh, in, in honor of the post-Passover season. Uh, the first is, has DCAS received any applications for deed restriction modifications since the recent legislation was passed into law? If so, how many and where? Second, as chair of the Committee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions, we are giving away city land every day for, for purposes very similar to Rivington. Has DCAS required any dig restrictions in these dispositions? And if not, why is it previously appropriate but no longer used? Additionally, uh, on the topic for uh, Deputy Commissioner Don Pinnock, uh, Medical leave cannot keep civil service and labor chair Danique Miller down. Uh, we have collaborated on two questions that we're both interested in answers to. Uh, with $480,000 proposed for automating exams in fiscal year 2019, 
and uh, in the last budget, uh, a commitment to getting 299 titles automated by fiscal year 18, how many were actually automated and how many are planned uh, since these were first implemented. And uh, similarly on the issue of uh, provisionals, uh, it seems like three steps forward, two steps back as has been the case for years. There have been fluctuations in the number of provisionals over the past several years. The most recently quarterly report in March indicated a reduction of only eight provisionals compared to this period ending in November 2017, going from uh, uh, 21,060 to 21,052. I believe the finance chair has already touched on this. Uh, what factors can be attributed to the plateau and substantial reductions of provisionals? And are there any other material resources needed to help administration achieve the implementation of the 2008 five-year plan 10 years later? So I will start, try and start and do these in order. So for the deed modifications, uh, we have had, since the passage and enactment of the legislation, we have had 10 uh, applications uh, filed for the removal of deed modifications. Uh, three of those have either been canceled or withdrawn. Four of those have progressed to through the, the legally required steps. There we have we've posted the notices um, and we have sent the the packet over for, to the Department of City Planning so that they can uh, undertake their review. Uh, one of them, I believe, is at the point where we have already posted the notice and have, have, are preparing to send the packets over to the Department of City Planning. And two, we have uh, been waiting for the documents uh, that are required in order for us to do the initial review. Uh, so since the, we've only had 10. Um, moving forward. And, and their locations, please. So we have one in uh, 77 Rutland Road, East Flatbush. Second is 1392 Bedford Avenue, Crown Heights. Third, 11, uh, 114A Marcus Garvey Boulevard, Bed-Stuy. The next one is 247 Bushwick Avenue, East Williamsburg. 1277 Putnam Avenue, Bushwick. 6601 Fleet Street, Forest Hills. 149 Rockway Avenue, Broadway Junction. 127 West 138th Street, Harlem, 262 West 121st Street, Harlem, 900 Intervale Avenue, Longwood. Please continue. Uh, with regard to your question about giving away city properties, I, it's a, if you can elaborate, I'm not sure what you mean by that. We, as DCAS, don't give away properties uh, generally, so I'm not sure if you're responding or referring to uh, other agencies' developments uh, where city land is used? Uh, happy to clarify. So the agency in principle that we work with in the Planning Dispositions and Concessions Committee is HPD, mm -hmm. and often it relates to vacant city lots. Uh, we can give you the specific address. I believe it was managed by uh, DCAS. It was a parking lot in uh, the South Bronx. It was in Council Member Ayala's district uh, where affordable housing is being constructed. And then similarly, we, we've had other properties that either were now belong, belong to the city as in-rem properties where they hadn't paid their taxes or uh, till properties through that process. So um, my understanding is DCAS is the real estate, is responsible for real estate portfolio. Uh, and so yeah. So the exception to uh, with DCAS um, for agencies that can also dispose of properties, HPD can do that. So although it is in DCAS's jurisdiction for a period of time, if HPD puts a hold on it or then takes it into their jurisdiction, they can sell that property. Um, so the program that you're referring to is all within that agency, and we don't have anything to do with um, administering it or setting the value or working with those developers. Is there an interest in requiring that property that's being disposed of from the city carry deed restrictions for the particular purpose, or is that now something the city is no longer interested in doing? Well, it's possible that HPD is putting deed restrictions they on are these not. properties. But again, that wouldn't be, if, if, if DCAS is going to sell it, which we, we don't have any plans to auction anything at the time, but would certainly consider putting a deed restriction on it. We just don't have anything in our portfolio right now for that. If, and, if, sorry, I wouldn't weigh in on HPD. Uh, in their mission to, to develop their properties. I don't believe 
HPD has ever put a deed restriction on anything, I think that DCAS would be it. So I guess the question is, will DCAS start putting deed restrictions on property that's turned over to HPD restricting it for affordable housing purposes only? HPD can put a deed restriction on the property. Okay. So I, so I, I couldn't answer that question without having I will take um, it up with HPD every time <laughs> I see them for the next two week, two week, every two weeks for the next four years. If we can continue with the questions on provisionals. Sure. And, uh, and the exams. The provisionals question um, we had discussed previously. The report that you reference is a point in time, and there has been, I guess, a delay in, in, in terms of when that, what that data captured, but the most recent numbers uh, we have show uh, a current provisional count of 20,164, which is the lowest number of provisionals uh, since uh, this has been tracked. Um, we are seeing progress, um, you know, every day, and we're, 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 we've done a lot of work using a lot of parallel, t on a parallel tracks to really drive that number down. Um, there are challenges, as we've discussed. Um, the city's hiring rate, um, they fluctuate, uh, the city fluctuates in what titles uh, they are hiring on depending on the need. Um, there are some times where the, the spike in hiring uh, coincides with civil service lists that are already established and uh, thereby uh, not having or needing to rely on provisional hiring. Specifically relating to um, the automation project, um, there were several phases. Um, the first phase, which um, essentially um, provided us an opportunity to create a system to um, provide, for the first time in the city's history, a fully automated exam to support our qualified incumbent exam, um, that part of the project has been completed. And we have been continuing to offer those automated exams since January of 2017. Um, I just wanted to um, just clarify that as part of the legislation, we had legal authorization to fully automate exams for 193 titles. So that automation is in place for those 193 titles. We've administered 185 of those exams. Um, in terms of other aspects of our automation project, um, I think that Councilmember Miller will be very happy to hear that um, a particular area of interest relating to transparency for our customers, that is um, slated to be completed by December of this year. Specifically, we are improving the um, automated experience, the front end experience for all of our customers. So their application history, um, having greater transparency into the civil service process, that will all um, be in place by December of 2018. Um, the remaining aspects of our automation project, which tie into the full automation of our education and experience tests and multiple choice exams. We are actively working on both of those aspects, but they will not be online until 2020. Okay, so just to clarify, in response last year to 2017's budget request, what we received from you is by fiscal year 2018, there will be a total of 299 titles with an associated automated exam. You are now coming back to say it's 193. Can you explain the specific disparity? Um, without having the benefit of reviewing the testimony, I can certainly clarify. So we also offer automated exams at our CTACs, which are our citywide, um, um, they are our computerized testing centers. So um, I'm guessing that the number also included the number of titles that we currently have automated. Primarily those are our social services titles, our public safety titles. We offer those exams routinely at our um, citywide training, excuse me, testing centers. And also with um, having four centers online, that has certainly increased our capacity so we can provide those numbers in terms of those titles. What I was referring to also were the other titles that we did mention, those 193 that are specifically covered by legislation that allows us to administer the qualified incumbent exams over a period of two years. I want to thank both chairs for their indulgence and uh, thank DCAS for an ongoing conversation. Our indulgence hopefully will lead to a blessing for me. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we want to say thank you to this panel. We're going to go to our next panel. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's uh, Executive Budget for Fiscal 19. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, and we have been joined by Councilmember Adams, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Perkins, and Councilmember Yeager. And Ben And Grudenchik and Van Bremer also, Kalos also. All were here. Okay. Uh, and we just heard from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and now we're going to hear from Michael Ryan, the Executive Director of the Board of Elections. I'm going to forego uh, my opening statement, as is Chair Cabrera, and we're going to go directly to uh, having uh, you sworn in, um, Director Ryan. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay. Would you like to begin? Yes. Uh, Chairs, uh, of Need the, the microphone up? The microphone, the microphone up? Thank you. Okay, yes, is that better? Thank you. Uh, Chair Cabrera and Chair Drum, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the City Council today with respect to the uh, budget for fiscal year 2018-2019. Uh, uh, seated to my right is the Board's Deputy Executive Director, uh, Dawn Sandow, and we are accompanied by uh, additional staff who are uh, seated also to my right in the seats. Uh, adjacent. Um, following the lead of the chairs, if it suits this committee, uh, I would uh, dispense with the reading of our written testimony. Uh, if, that's, uh, if that's okay, it will be part of the record, and we can go uh, right to the, uh, the questions uh, and answer period if, if that's your preference. Otherwise, I can read it into the record. Uh, we'll, we'll go right to questions then. Fine. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Sure. So um, let me start off by talking a little bit about budgetary surplus and attracting poll workers. Over the past several years, the BOE has had an end-year surplus. In fiscal 2017, this totaled 8.6 million, and in fiscal 2016, this surplus totaled 16.3 million. How much of these surpluses are due to the inability to attract the number of poll workers you need to properly uh, operate the poll sites? Uh, it varies from year to year, but that is certainly an element of the surplus. Uh, in a, say, in a presidential year, we may budget for 42,000 poll workers. In a, in a small year, perhaps 37. So using last year as a barometer, we had 37,000 uh, poll workers budgeted for roughly, and approximately 32,000 uh, showed up on Election Day. Uh, you, you take that shortfall of 5,000, times it by an election event, and times it by uh, you know, $200 uh, to $300, depending on whether we're talking about poll workers or poll site coordinators, and there you have your math. So yes, uh, a large portion of our surplus uh, is uh, dealing with the poll worker recruitment issue. So poll workers are paid about $200 a day, and probably they work close to 16 hours. That actually then equals less than the minimum wage. Has thought been given to increasing the salary for poll workers? The last time the poll workers received a raise was by executive order, I believe, in 2001. Uh, so that means we're now uh, two and a half administrations later, and still there has been no poll worker raise. Uh, every year, as part of our legislative package, uh, there is another avenue to go for uh, poll worker raises, and that would be that the New York State Legislature uh, can order a poll worker raise, uh, but that could also be done by executive order. We believe that a raise uh, would help uh, att not only attract, but also retain, because very often we're finding that we're getting people, they come in, they work that entire day, and they realize what it's all about, and, and then they don't come back, which, which doubles the problem, because now we've trained them, they've gotten some experience, and then we lose them. So uh, you said executive order. That's by the mayor? Yes. That's mayor's executive order could raise the poll worker uh, pay at, at any time. Do you know um, if poll workers are paid differently or more around the state? Actually, they're paid less. Uh, the statutory requirement is less. The, the current uh, executive order that's in effect in New York City uh, is, is a raise over what poll workers get in the, in the remainder of the state. Uh, and we've, we've asked the state to reconsider that or in lieu of state reconsideration, uh, mayor executive order. What about the idea, I'm a, by the way, I'm a district leader and I try to help get poll workers. It is very difficult to recruit them. Um, uh, the idea of, of cutting their hours in half. I mean, you, in one sense, maybe you're thinking, all right, if you can't get enough to cover for the full time, how are you going to get enough to cover for half time? But 
I do get complaints from poll workers that they're there, you know, and they're mostly, a lot of them are senior citizens, are there for 16 hours, and it's a lot for them to be able to do in one day. So, so that's an interesting question, and it's, and it's one that we have embraced. And as a matter of fact, there has been a recent change in the state legislation that allows the commissioners with m more discretion in terms of prorating the pay. Uh, so we tried a pilot in Brooklyn, uh, and it seemed to work successfully in the few poll sites that we did it in. Uh, the problem that we had, believe it or not, was as low as the poll worker pay rate is, we still have a uh, difficulty attracting poll workers at a reduced rate. The folks that we're getting as poll workers need every nickel of the, of the money that they're getting. Uh, the way I would look at it is it's, it's almost like a holiday account uh, for, you know, for some of these folks where they have an extra, you know, $1,500 if, depending on the, uh, the number of elections per, you know, per year and the, and, the, and the incentive. So they want that money. And uh, we rely on, on those folks to come back every time. So we would like to have a more robust, uh, you know, split shift uh, program. Uh, we just have found some difficulty attracting people uh, to do that. But if there are pockets uh, around the city that uh, we have people that are willing to do it, we're certainly willing to, to entertain that. Anything that we can do to enhance the, uh, the election day worker experience and the voter experience is, is stuff that we'll entertain. Well, I definitely would be interested in working with you on that. Um, the other question I guess I have is uh, oftentimes people who are on public assistance uh, can only make up to, I think, $600 or something, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe even four, without losing benefits. Um, is there any thought about how we might be able to either work around that or change that so that they would be eligible to, sometimes it's two primaries or, you know, and one general or, three primaries depending on the year, and then that pushes them over the limit. I'm not certain about the specific monetary cutoffs, but I am aware of the problem, uh, Councilman, that you, uh, that you address here. One of the difficulties uh, that has confronted the, the boards of election throughout the country was, and this came up in, in prior city council hearings. Matter of fact, there was a young lawyer that researched it for the city council and came back to me and I think he was a little surprised that I was right. Uh, there is an IRS regulation uh, that, that says that we have to treat the poll workers as employees. So we process those folks in as you would any other employee. And then on top of that, we have to uh, withhold the appropriate amount of taxes. Uh, and that all has to be done on a W-2. Our preference clearly would be to treat them as, as day workers and issue uh, and issue 1099s for each election event and consider that separately. Unfortunately, the IRS has told us we can't do that. This may sound crazy, but is there any possibility of making everybody a super poll worker? They earn 300, I think. Uh, the coordinators do that. Um, the, oh, the poll worker rate of compensation is, is set by statute. That, considering everyone to be a coordinator is not something, uh, an idea that we have discussed internally, uh, certainly something that I could bring back to the Board of Commissioners uh, and see if that's, uh, if that's something that they'd be willing to entertain. Of course, then that does create, a, you know, a bit of inequity for the folks that are serving as the coordinators. So it's, it's a little bit of a concern, but... What about the people, the people who travel in cars? The, they go from site AD to site. Monitors. The AD monitors, uh, those folks, um, we have some AD monitors that, that are staff, and then we have uh, the AD monitors that, uh, that, are, that are poll workers. What's, what, they get paid 300. How much? They get paid 300. Uh, as they get paid coordinator rate of pay, and basically what they're doing for us is they're being our eyes and ears out in the field on election day, and they're, they're troubleshooting. Uh, they deal with uh, eight, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act compliance issues as well as other uh, and tablet issues and poll site setup issues, so they get paid the $300 per day. Well, we definitely need more poll workers, so look forward to working with you on that. Uh, temporary ramps at poll sites. I understand the BOE uh, uses temporary ramps at poll sites and they install and uninstall them for elections. How much funding are we planning to spend on temporary ramps at poll sites for fiscal 2019? Um, we have approximately 370 sites that are marked as final. Uh, 
that is an expenditure of $2 million in ramp uh, purchase and $2 million annual cost for installation, transportation, and storage. I certainly could give uh, the council the exact breakdown, but we deal with multiple vendors now. Um, this process has been ongoing for the last several years, um, and we don't have the control over these facilities, so we have been pushed in the direction of providing temporary uh, ramping. So that would be, um, we have an additional 270 sites that we're expecting final surveys on within the next fiscal year, and that could push uh, those expenditures by an additional 1.5 million in equipment and an additional 1.5 million for uh, installation, transportation, and storage. And, and just to be clear, uh, our partners with the Board of, uh, of the Department of Education also help us install ramps. We also install some ramps with our own staff, but we have a pool of vendors that deliver, install, uh, uninstall, and in some cases store those ramps off-site for us. So it's it's quite a quite an undertaking, and we have to do this all in a 24 to 48 hour period prior to an election event, and then of course. Uh, the sites, particularly the private sites, they want that equipment uninstalled and, and, and taken away relatively quickly after the, uh, after the election event is concluded. So these ramps that you installed, they're all um, ADA approved, right? They're all yes. at, at the correct level uh, of height, et cetera. So correct. One of the issues that we've confronted, even in circumstances where permanent ramping has been installed, often it is not installed to the uh, technical specifications. And there are certain tolerances built within that, but if we go over a certain slopage, like if it's more than six degrees, uh, that starts to be a danger area for us. And then if you get up into that double digit, the 10 degrees to 12 degrees, you run the risk of a manual wheelchair user actually having to reach so far back in the wheels that they can tip their uh, wheelchair over backwards and suffer injury. So it's not something that, you know, uh, we take lightly, uh, and, it, and it's a necessary part of making the elections process accessible Would for everyone. Would you know at how many schools you have to place these, um, these um, temporary ramps? Because um, he, he, here's what I'm trying to get at. I've been pushing the DOE, I used to be chair of the Education Committee, to make the schools more accessible. And um, I mean, just during the day for students as well. And it would seem to me with the amount of money we're spending on temporary placement of ramps, if we were to look down the road further and get SCA to do some of this work in advance, we could actually wind up saving millions of dollars. Most of, and I will get specific information, we have it back at the office, but the vast majority of the sites that we place temporary ramping at are schools. Um, and. And it's not just uh, the ramping. There are other simpler fixes that could be done at these buildings. For example, if you have a fire extinguisher that is installed on a, on a wall and not recessed, that becomes a potential hazard uh, for someone using uh, a cane to, uh, uh, you know, particularly somebody with vision difficulties that's using a cane. So we have to uh, address those elements that are not cane detectable and it's a simple fix, but a necessary one. We have to put basically a traffic cone beneath the fire extinguisher so that if somebody is walking along the wall with a cane, that they notice something is there and they, and they move around the, the abutment. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any discussions with SCA on this issue? Uh, we have regular meetings with the Department of Education. Uh, they, they, in the beginning, they were like every two weeks, uh, and now they're scheduled monthly. They probably occur every six weeks, and we go over these issues. Uh, but uh, the SCA is entrenched in its five-year plans, and I understand, having done uh, you know, construction with the city uh, going back over time, that the capital uh, bond cap can be somewhat unforgiving, and they, they have limited flexibility uh, but there are things that can be done separate and apart from uh, the, the long-term fixes. For example, permanent accessibility signage on the exterior of government buildings. We put up temporary signs to, to give an indication where the accessibility entrance is. 
uh, but they're held up with string and tape. And if it's inclement weather or it's windy, they blow away. But the big thing that they're missing is Braille. And we don't have the ability to reproduce a usable Braille temporary sign for a, for a government building that has an accessibility entrance anyway. And if those signs were installed at pro appropriate intervals on the exterior of government buildings at the specific heights set by the Americans with Disabilities Act, we could stop making these temporary signs, stop delivering them, and rely on the permanent signage that's affixed to the buildings. Well, thank you. Uh, you look, we uh, did call for an addition of $125 million in funding in the preliminary budget response from the council uh, for accessibility at schools. And so I look forward to continuing to fight for this uh, as we move down the road. And um, I would love to come to one of these meetings between you and the SCA to discuss this issue. So let's make that happen. Okay? Certainly, we can, we can get the schedule and, and you know, we're, we're not hiding anything. We, we need everybody's help we can get. So yeah, you're certainly welcome, it Councilman. Seems, it seems to me that there should be a way to be able to fix this. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, get into, well, I just, I just have to address this issue that you brought uh, because I, I just want to get some details regarding, I, regarding compliance with the state uh, and minimum wage will poll workers. What, what, what does that put you in, in, in a situation? What happens if you're out of compliance? Our rate of pay that we pay poll workers uh, is established statutorily. So as I said, by executive order, even though it's a 17-year-old executive order, we still are north of what the current statute requires poll workers to be paid. So it's my understanding that such a, uh, a another provision, we're exempted from that other provision. But we're, we're already paying more than the rest of the state. We just think that we need to pay more given, uh, you know, the vagaries of life in New York City. But next year it's going to be $15 an hour, right? Minimum wage. What will happen then? That will put us in the fiscal year. Correct, you know, but I, my understanding, and this is not my area of expertise, but my understanding is that municipal governments have been exempt from the $15 an hour wage requirement. If that's a mistake, uh, it, it, it's a mistake. Um, if it's not a mistake and we have to comply with the $15 uh, dollar an hour wage requirement, then, then it becomes a simpler proposition. If the law requires it, it will, it'll be a new need and the city will get a bill. Okay, interesting. We'll definitely uh, do some search regarding that particular issue because I'm, I'm not sure myself, uh, but if we are, and even if we're not, we should. Uh, we definitely uh, should pay our people what they truly deserve. I want to get into cybersecurity. At the preliminary budget hearing, you asked for an additional $1.3 million for cybersecurity, which you didn't get And in your um, testimony. Uh, you have written that it is the board's understanding that this request has been deferred to provide an opportunity for newly created cyber command office to evaluate this proposal. Can you give us a little bit more details about that? Certainly. Uh, the, the city's uh, chief information security officer, uh, Jeff Brown, uh, I first came to be aware of Mr. Brown in the lead up to the 2016 uh, presidential election. Um, we have worked closely uh, to meet the cybersecurity needs uh, of the Board of Elections. Uh, we hold uh, tabletop exercises in advance of each election event to make sure that um, we have coordinated messaging and that all of the relevant uh, players are at the table, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, city, uh, state and federal, uh, everyone's at the table. What, what Mr. Brown has uh, advocated for on our behalf uh, is the 24 by 7 by 365 uh, cybersecurity monitoring that's done by an outside uh, entity, FireEye Mandiant, um, that's under a contract uh, through uh, Do It. My understanding is now that there has been a, uh, a spin-off, if you will, uh, and that we now have a cyber uh, command office, which Mr. Brown is a part of. Uh, and it's my further understanding that 
to ensure that everybody's on the same page, that conversation has been deferred so that there is clearance and Cyber Command understands uh, what we're going to be doing and the justification for what we're doing. We haven't received any indication that there is a no. If there was an indication that there was a no, I would certainly make the council uh, aware of that. Um, it's my understanding that it's just a new process that is underway uh, and, uh, and we expect to be able to revisit that on or before November of 2018. So let, let me see if I understand right. So if uh, the Cyber Command unit takes over, uh, you no longer need the $1.3 million, uh, but it, is it in your opinion that this, this should be the approach for Cyber Command uh, to take over cybersecurity, or, or it should be uh, solely under the Department right. of Elections. So I want to be clear. The Cyber Command has not taken over uh, cybersecurity. What we were able to do uh, for procurement purposes was leverage uh, an already existing contract that covers as an umbrella uh, the entire city of New York. So what they did was they carved out a piece of that contract. Uh, we're not a party to the contract. Gotcha. However, we do behave as if we are the party to the contract. Cybersecurity does not interface with us in terms of our relationship with the outside vendor. We deal with them directly as if it's our own contract. So that was simply a funding mechanism to make sure that that happened. Um, what I think uh, they, they want to do here as a, as a newer entity is to see what all the agencies are doing and make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes, that, what F, that we're all rowing this boat in the same direction uh, since there is some overlap. Uh, and I think that I'm comfortable with that approach and I'm comfortable with the interaction that uh, our agency has had uh, with Mr. Brown. Um, and I'm getting no indication that they're attempting in any way, shape, or form to interfere with the board operations. They want to make sure that whatever we're doing, Everybody knows what each other is doing so that all our efforts are moving in the right direction. Right. That's, what I, that's the way I see it. If that changes, I'll certainly uh, let everyone know. I'm happy to hear that if indeed that's the intention, uh, there is uh, an attempt for coordinated, uh, a coordinated effort, uh, and that, uh, that obviously uh, makes sense. On April 18, as you know, uh, uh, of this year, Governor Cuomo signed an executive order to restore voting rights to New Yorkers and parole. Uh, if you could just explain to us and share with us how is the BOE responding to the new executive order? Uh, has the BOE initiated any conversation with the parole uh, board? And, and how uh, you will go about managing this. Right. Presently, we are awaiting specific direction from the New York State Board of Elections. Uh, because even though we are an independent Board of Elections, the New York State Board of Elections is the official repository for all things voter registration. Um, we Recently, uh, there was a reach out, and it, it was just prior to the executive order um, done by the, uh, by the governor. Uh, we had to reach out from a regional manager at the, uh, at the Division of Parole, and what we participated in was an event for, I think it was approximately 60 or so, uh, it might have been about, about 100 or so individuals who were 60 days away from being discharged uh, from parole to give them some information about uh, restoring their voting rights and what they, uh, what they need to do in order to make that happen. Uh, that, of course, was just prior to the executive order when the rules clearly were if you registered to vote while on parole, that could be a parole violation. Uh, so as soon as we see, receive more clear direction from uh, the State Board of Elections, uh, we'll be guided accordingly. So there's going to be an attempt eventually to contact every single one who are in parole? Uh, and let I'm not certain what the directions are going to be from the State Board of Elections, uh, but we have to follow their guidance in this regard because the nice voter system is the province of the State Board of Elections, and the New York City Board of Elections, like the other 57 counties, are simply uh, we donate our information to the, to the state roles. Well, I sure hope so, uh, and we'll, from our office, we'll definitely uh, communicate uh, at the state level. 
uh, you know, this executive order, to be honest with you, is useless if people don't know about it. And so, because this has been part of uh, the political culture for many, many years, uh, and so people already have a paradigm that says, you know, if you're in parole, you can't vote. And so, um, definitely pursuing that in any uh, communications you could forward also as, way, as well of, you know, upstairs. Uh, we can certainly reach out to the State Board of Elections and find out where in the hopper uh, and how far along this, this, this matter is, uh, and I can provide more information for you than I presently have. That would be great. Director, one last question, because I know colleagues have questions. Can you give us a brief summary of what budgetary requests were not included in the executive budget for BOE? Well, as we discussed, uh, the, uh, the cybersecurity issue uh, was not included. Uh, there was some additional um, OTPS funding that was really a, a fairly long list because it was little pieces of, and pockets of money uh, interspersed throughout the agency. But the lion's share of the shortfall, uh, quite frankly, is the uh, increase in the poll worker pay uh, that we were looking for. That was about $10 million. Uh, so that's really where the shortfall occurs. Uh, an aggregate number of poll workers paid even at two to $300 uh, adds up very quickly, uh, particularly in years when you have multiple election events. So that, that money is really what we're talking about here. Well, ho hopefully there will be some movement there because it's the right thing to do for our constituents. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chair. it over to my co-chair. Okay, great. Councilmember Kalos followed by Adams and then Powers. Thank you, uh, Chairs. Uh, just to start with a uh, familiar refrain, uh, how many of the jobs at the Board of uh, Elections are currently posted? Has the Board of Elections hired any jobs in the past fiscal year without publicly posting that job? And uh, were our finance chair and uh, uh, Gov Ops Chair interested in adding a term and condition to the budget that we would not pay for any positions at the Board of Elections that were not publicly posted, would that somehow hamper your ability to conduct elections with your current staff? Well, leaving what I would say is would be an action by the City Council that would be perpendicularly contrary to New York State election law uh, by trying to place such a restriction. If we leave that piece of the puzzle off to the side, um, I do not have specific information with respect to uh, individual hirings. However, we do have uh, a significant number of jobs that are, that are posted. We publish a, a weekly uh, vacancy list. Uh, more often than not, our internal permanent employees come from folks uh, that are temporary employees. And, that, and, and it's a very simple sequence. Mostly we get poll workers that end up becoming temporary employees, and the temporary employees start out as seasonal, and then they go to become temporary employees that work all year, and then they become a permanent. It's really, there's not that much mystery to this whole process. But I, I understand that this has been a particular splinter in your, in, in your uh, toe, Councilman, uh, but I don't think the answer has changed over the years. I'll, I'll keep asking. And then uh, just a, a point of, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, H have you ever had occasion to go to pay for something with your credit card and uh, they, they didn't have a pen and paper for you to sign, but they, they had a, a digital tablet that you signed and then that was used to uh, determine whether or not your credit card was charged and then in fact your credit card may have been charged? So is that a yes or no answer? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Thank you. I uh, cede the rest of my time. Okay. Hey, thank you, Council Member. We've been joined by Council Member Cumbo, Majority Leader Cumbo, and uh, questions from Council Member Adams and then Powers. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you. Um, I have just have a, a couple of questions. I'm just really curious. Um, as to the location of poll sites, I represent District 28 in Southeast Queens, and we've had 
uh, multiple changes due to redistricting over the past four, five, six years or so. We've had a lot of changes in movement. Uh, as far as our poll sites are concerned, we've had a lot of senior citizens who have been greatly inconvenienced uh, by some changes and closures of sites. Uh, in the district and in Southeast Queens as a whole. Um, we also had uh, disenfranchisement of some seniors and other uh, uh, voters with disabilities, specifically at uh, the Queens Transition Center um, uh, over the past uh, two years or so because of a change in location from the auditorium to an upper floor that is a District 75 site and they do have an elevator, but during the warmer months, it, it was very, very, very difficult for voters with disabilities. I witnessed it myself, and a lot of that, that was in 20, uh, 2016, and by 2017 when I revisited again, after hearing that they would never come back to that polling site because of the great inconvenience that they suffered the previous year, there was quite uh, a, a change uh, in voter representation, and that's just one particular site that I'm talking about because I witnessed it and it was very bad just because of a mere floor change from the auditorium because they said lighting was poor, but it worked for a million years prior to that. Um, that said, what are the factors of consideration when determining the location of a poll site? So, primary factor is availability. Of, of a facility, and that is a, a challenge throughout the city, uh, particularly in the older neighborhoods. And the older neighborhoods have a tendency to have older buildings, which have a tendency to have more ADA compliance uh, issues. Uh, so with respect to a, a specific instance of, of an issue uh, that, that you raised, uh, I would say that we try uh, to be available and we recognize that elected officials are elected to represent their constituency. So you speak uh, for the voters in your district, and we have no interest in making it more difficult uh, for the voters in your district to vote. And I can point to a particular instance, and, and Chair Drum probably can tell me uh, the specific location, but there was a similar circumstance uh, several years ago uh, in, in, in Chair Drum's district, and he brought it to our attention, and we worked collectively and collaboratively, and we relocated uh, the poll site to a, a more suitable location. We do the very best we can. Uh, one of the things that we're bringing into the process uh, for the, uh, in it, from a software assistance uh, perspective is we're going to be internally use, utilizing in the coming year 3D mapping as a part of a suite of software that we already have. We hope that that will give us assistance in understanding the topography uh, of a particular location as opposed to looking at a flat map on a piece of paper. So we're certainly uh, available, uh, both in our local office in Queens and through the, the general office. If you have specific instances that are difficult, um, we can certainly help. The other piece of it, though, that we experienced in 2017 leading up to 2020, we have specific numbers of uh, voters, uh, 1,150 is the largest we can have in an election district. The problem is, and this is, this is gonna be a real government answer, but it is what it is. Um, in March of years ending in seven, we have a blackout that we cannot add additional election districts uh, until December 1st of years ending in zero. So that means, and that's for us as the board to get out of the way of state reapportionment. So we had to reapportion all of our election districts prospectively to allow for growth. When we add an election district, that means we're adding an election district table and adding election district chairs and we're adding poll workers, which then encroaches on our ability to be compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So those are the kinds of uh, complex challenges uh, that, that we confront. That having been said, uh, we never pretend to be more expert about the neighborhoods, areas, and availability of buildings, uh, in particular uh, smaller subdivisions throughout the city. So if you have uh, those kinds of things in your district, we will make sure that you have all of the contact information you need at the Board of Elections uh, to raise the issue uh, in between election events. You, you know, the, the time for us for those issues to be raised is, you know, in non-federal years, you know, after January, uh, we can 
uh, make the designations before May 1st. That's the guidepost. We have to make all poll site designations by May 1st. Of course, if someone is willing to volunteer even a private site, we can do that off of that schedule. But any information that you have that you want to share with us, site visits, going out to particular locations. I've done it for numerous other elected officials throughout the city, and I'm sure as long as I'm sitting in this chair, I'll be doing it for numerous more, and we're happy to do it for you. I appreciate that. Is there any type of survey system that you have right now that shows you a record of whether or not the BOE is in um, uh, ADA compliance at all? At August Martin High School, we've got steps right. and 90 year old senior right. citizens going down steps to vote. Right. Every one of our poll sites is required to be surveyed, not only initially, but in an ongoing basis, uh, pursuant to a federal court order. As I had stated earlier, uh, the little nuance in my testimony was that we have 270 sites left. Uh, I'm not certain if the site to which you speak is one of those 270 sites that's left, uh, but we're going through this methodically in um, conjunction with a court-appointed overseer, Evan Terry Associates are a nationally recognized ADA compliance uh, entity and surveying uh, a company. So we work with them, uh, and they, we have to, to some extent, follow their uh, guidance. We do have a little bit of room uh, for pushback, and in certain exceptional circumstances, um, we have been able to work with them where they recognize that the remedy let's say a 10 block move, right, if that's the only other building that's available, was worse uh, than, uh, you know, the initial circumstance. So it's a, it's a lot of back and forth. Um, we're trying. Um, we don't have the ability to uh, knock down all of the uh, buildings in New York City that are not ADA compliant and, and, and rebuild them according to spec. So we work with what we have and we're trying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ryan, just as a follow-up, you had mentioned about creation of new um, EDs. Uh, in the 34th Assembly District in Queens, new EDs were added prior to the City Council election last year, but I don't recall having gotten notification about that. Can you tell me, look, it's in the past, but whatever, how you go about notifying folks of the creation of new EDs? Well, the, the one absolute way we do it um, is in the annual information notice. And if your election district changed on the outside of your annual district. But I uh, mean to elected in, the, in a district where um, there were, those ADs were not, non-existent before. My understanding is that the local staff is uh, to have communication with the local elected officials. If that needs to be uh, beefed up, I can certainly uh, address that with the borough chiefs and deputies to make sure that when these things happen, uh, that, that better communication occurs. The, the bad news would be if it didn't occur, and I would apologize for that. The good news is it's not going to occur again until after December 1st, 2020, so we have a little bit of time to fix the issue. Okay. Yeah, just because... Um for the people who were running for office did not know that the EDs were created. <laughs> yes, no, I, I understand, and, and we'll, we'll get you that information. I'll, I'll check with our candidate records unit uh, to determine what, if any, notifications went out, and we'll certainly okay. uh, reply back to you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Powers, followed by Yeager. Thank you. I had uh, another set of questions, but I'm going to use it to also air my local grievances, <laughs> uh, uh, which is, uh, I, my, my question was, you talked about the EDs changing not being able to change between seven and zero uh the but the locations obviously can change in terms of where those you can take right. an ed out of one location and move it to another location Correct. I, I don't want to give the impression that just because an election district changed that the poll site automatically changed agreed but in, what, in, what in it what, does is case. it encroach the the equipment that needs to be deployed can encroach on each other and we have to have the appropriate circulation uh paths for um, the uh, the disability uh, community. Understood. My okay. question is, if there is a polling place that was moved and we have identified potential alternative locations for it to move, meaning that it's moved 15 blocks away or further away from where somebody might be, we were trying to encourage voting. Correct. And to make move it far could discourage turnout. And so if we have an alternate location, in we, with the amount of elections we have this year, and who knows how many more that will be added in whatever borough this year or whatever uh, area, the is there a timeline by which you, like what is the amount of time you need to do proper notification for, okay. a, uh, to, for a change? Okay, so there's, there is 
No set statutory timeline with respect to notifications. We are, as we sit here today, beyond the statutory timeline that the commissioners have to designate poll sites for the following year. So we, we are beyond the period of time where we could designate as of right. That having been said, if there are exceptional circumstances that are creating a hardship for voters in a particular district, we can you know, do site visits, listen to proposals, see what the alternative solution is, uh, communicate with the commissioners. If it's, you know, we're probably too late to do anything, say, for the June primary, but if it was an exceptional circumstance and we had an alternative location and everybody was on board and the persons that's in control of the property, whether it's a private site or a public site, are willing so to all cooperate. Let me just, let me just cause the time, September, yep. November, we may, there may be opportunity if we, if we talk to you about revisiting. C correct, and whatever. potentially even September, depending on, you know, what, what we're talking about, because keep in mind, we send out our annual information notice um, between August 5th and August 1st and August 5th every year. We got to go to print, uh, you know, sometime middle of July. Okay. So we, we have a little bit of time. But uh, we got to move. All right. But, so but we, we'd we'll, have uh, to move. We'll and be, you know. if there's an emergency, like, for example, several years ago, I think it was John F. Kennedy High School had a gas explosion and we had of course, a yeah, no, site, of course. you know, I'm quickly. talking about the ordinary. So, ordinary so we can do it, but it has so, to be done quickly. So just because I'm on the clock here, right. the, uh, for back to the poll worker issue, I mean, there's been a number of proposals around other ways to recruit poll workers. Some have talked about a municipal poll worker program where you could have city a day off to, to do a part or a uh, full day, or uh, I think CUNY might have a program around recruiting students to, to, to be become poll workers. Right. I, and then the part day, the increase in pay. So I have two questions on that front. One is, have any of those programs something that the, that the board has considered, uh, and I think you piloted at least one of them, but uh, considered or put resources into or will be considering or need the council to help fund something to help do a pilot? And the second question is around the compensation. Was that a, was that a mayoral executive order that raised the pay? Yeah. And if so, does that mean that the council could – through its budgetary or legislative process, increase it further, or does the mayor need to act? I'm not sure the the, the role there. Does the mayor need to act again okay. with an executive order to raise it? Because I do have the same concern, which is we aren't paying that much for the work that the, the amount of time. All right. So so I appreciate the fact that you were running out of time and you you, you threw a lot uh, you threw a lot out there. So uh, with respect to the mayor's uh, relationship and interaction with the city council, I'm content to leave that uh, where it is. Uh, it was an opinion about what we get. I I'm I'm not certain, but like I okay. said, I, that's that's uh, you know something that needs to be worked out within the four walls of this building. Got it. I don't know that I add anything. To I'll that take it up. Equation, with, uh, I'll right? walk across that. Uh, but in, in any event. Um, what was uh, the first one was about other poll worker right, programs. other poll worker programs? Yes, CUNY. We've tried to partner with them. Uh, it seems like the November election is a bad time for them. Uh, you know, Final midterm and, exams yeah. and whatever. Um, we do. Uh, we're having a pretty good run at it, uh, and I can get specific information offline with respect to the students as poll workers. You know, high school students. The problem that we have with them is we do them, and then you know they graduate and they go on to college, and, and we lose them. But with respect to the municipal poll worker, municipal workers as poll workers, uh, I had uh, myself and Ms. Sandow had discussed with uh, with uh, Chair Cabrera when we we met with him about the possibility of being creative and and looking you know for different options. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I believe it was uh, Councilman Kalos had uh, thrown out the idea of having a split shift with municipal workers as a full supplement to the the complement of poll workers that we have, not in place of, and have them come in and do the critical functions, you know, from five o'clock in the morning to say eight or nine o'clock, get us up and running, have a reliable group of folks that are paid to show up and have real supervisors to answer to at the back end of the day if they don't show up on time, and then uh, at the end of the night, have them come, maybe not that same group or a different group, come back in at six or seven and help us close the polls. And I think that there's opportunities uh, through the budget uh, process 
uh, for us to be able to do that and still not run afoul of any of the city unions. Okay, thank you. And, and Chair Drama, I will, I will report to you, this is my last day as a district leader in this great county of New York City. So I will no longer be able to reassign polling places <laughs> and do all recruit poll workers, but I, uh, but I will luckily still be on this committee and have a large role in it. So thank you, thank you to the chair. Well, hopefully, whoever's taking over will uh, do as I good job as you've done. I trust him. I trust him. All right, <laughs> Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, Mr. Director, is there currently a law that uh, would serve to require the board to post? job openings with which the board is not currently in compliance? No. Thank you. All right, we're good. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. And we're going to um, now move to the other room for the other hearings that are happening. So if you're here for the um, campaign finance and the Law Department, we're going to move it next door. Thank you.